company culture was a hot topic in 2020 due to the worldwide work from home the pandemic imposed on us. My show was born into the conversation. Enter Seth Godin and his book, This is Marketing. He said one line that shifted the axis of my show from conversations about company culture from the C-suite to emerging leaders. What was that line? Culture is strategy. Since entire companies conducted business in their kitchens, the rise of no bullshit work-life balance was not just important, but critical. This impacted the growing mental health issues that piggybacked the pandemic. Now we find ourselves with many conversations from quiet quitting to what leadership can be. Can we shift more than the narrative and create the best job you ever had? Seth Godin is the author of 21 international bestsellers that have changed the way people think about work. His latest book, The Song of Significance, he writes one of the most popular marketing blogs in the world, and two of his TED Talks are among the most popular of all time. He is the founder of the Alt MBA, the social media pioneer with Squidoo and Yo-Yo Dine, one of the first internet companies. At this critical juncture in business and culture, I'm excited to have the Seth Godin on my show. Join me as he ushers in powerful lessons for business in the Song of Significance. Hello, Coffee Culture family. I am really excited because today, Seth Godin and Holly Shannon are going to be together on the show. So welcome, Seth. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sorry we can't share coffee from the same machine, but I could talk about coffee and culture and better and magic all day. So thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. So why don't we start with the easiest question? Um, what do you drink? What's in your coffee cup? Well, I roast my own beans and I make mm -hmm. uh, coffee every day for my wife, but I can't drink coffee because it doesn't agree with me. So I taste it and I love it, but I'm drinking herbal tea as I often do, like 20 cups a day. Wow. Well, it's so nice that you still engage in the ritual for your wife. I think that's really special. It's, uh, it's a wonderful combination of uh, mechanics and science and art. And the way you're supposed to do it is measure everything and I measure nothing. So who knows? But she still drinks the coffee every day. So I guess it's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she, was, she went off it for a little while, but then guests to our house kept reminding me how good my coffee was. So now she's back on. So who knows? Excellent. Well, I want to dive into your new book. I'm very excited to share the song of significance with everybody. So what I'd like to do is start at the beginning um, and talk about the infrastructure of industrialization. And you, you state in the book that we get prizes for standing on the red dot. It starts in school, it, it bleeds into our work life and into our leisure time. So can you share that theory and, and why it has let industrialization thrive? So we're so in the deep in the water, we don't even realize we're in the water. Industrialism made us rich. Industrialism gave us the computers we're talking on. It gave us the food we eat, the clothes we wear. 120 years ago, the average person in the United States owned two pairs of shoes and two pairs of pants. That there were no cars, there were very few roads, everything was different. And so it was a miracle when we figured out how to create management and the assembly line and uh, the stock market and financial instruments and all the things that go with us. And one of the things we did as soon as we realized just how powerful it was, we built public school and modeled private school on it as an institution to train people to go to work and do what they're told. So if you say, will this be on the test? you are asking a smart question because even at the age of eight, you realize that your job is to only do the things that they can measure and leave everything else away uh, on the side. And if you mess up, they quote, fail you, hold you back a year, reprocess you, and then spit you out, which sounds a lot like a factory to me because it is. The end result of all of that 
is in addition to the magical side effects that we all get to enjoy, we also got a huge amount of industrial pollution. We burned so much carbon, we changed the climate of our entire planet. And we have deadened our souls. At the same time, we spend more money on self-storage units than we spent at the biggest year ever at Hollywood. Um, it's this weird situation. But now, 2023 rolls around. We've got AI. We've got outsourcing. We've got robots. We've got layoffs. We've got turnover. We've got systems that can measure everything we do. We are under surveillance. And I think people are finally starting to realize that being a cog in the system is not what they want. And so my book is a rant and a plea, shining a light on the fact that there is an opportunity to sing a different song, the song of significance, and build a job that we're thrilled to be part of. So if the song of significance is um, work that matters, um, work that cannot be automated, mechanized, or outsourced, as you said, um, would the onset maybe of AI in a growing freelance economy, could this be an opportunity to make way for significant work? It's a huge opportunity. You know, when the steam shovel came along, you and I didn't speak up on behalf of the ditch diggers because we weren't ditch diggers. And the fact that they couldn't dig ditches anymore wasn't our problem. But amazingly, the people who used to dig ditches after some dislocation found something better to do. And my argument about the end of mediocrity is that any average job that can be done by a computer will be done faster and cheaper than you do it. And what are you going to do instead? Well, the only thing you can do is a job a computer can't. And that doesn't have to be a fancy job with a fancy title. It can be a barista who's going beyond pressing the button on their Slayer and beyond handing over a cup and collecting the money and actually making you feel like it was worth going out of your way to walk into that coffee shop instead of using your AeroPress at home. And that human connection is available for nurses. It's available for doctors. It's available for baristas. It's available for people who write books and podcasters and everyone in between. But we have been seduced into walking away from it. I feel that so much. I feel uh, such a degradation of customer service because everybody is so focused on the machine that they're taking your order from and asking for a tip and giving you a survey as you leave in your email. How was the service? And uh, can we give you a survey for our survey? Like it's never ending, but there's yep. really absolutely no connection happening whatsoever. Right. So here's something I do for fun. I don't know why. Thank you, old man, I guess. <laughs> when I get those surveys from companies that should know better, the ones that are three or four pages long, on the last page, it says anything else we should know. And I said, well, yeah, there's plenty, but you don't care. And if you did care, you would call me. Here's my phone number. And I have done that 50 times and no one has ever called. Wow. That's because it's not anyone's job to care. It's, it's, it's sad to me that empathy and hospitality and customer service are basically in the toilet at this moment. And I actually think that COVID perpetuated it, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that once we had to emotionally and socially distance from each other and wear masks and confronted our own mortality, it adds up to a lot of uh, survival, selfish behavior. But in this moment, we have this unbelievable opportunity because the world is changing whether you want it to or not. We are moving toward a more resilient climate-based economy. We are eliminating huge swaths of mind-numbing labor. And there's more people on earth than ever before. We've invest invented 8 billion jobs since I was born. Where did those jobs come from? Right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to invent some more jobs. So maybe you could invent some jobs or maybe you could invent a job for yourself where you add actual value in a way that you would be missed if you were gone. That's beautifully said, actually. <laughs> um, in your chapter, A Compass Before We Draw a Map, you posit that what each revolution has in common is that it is inconvenient and that revolutions happen on the edges. 
and whatever it interacts with, it changes. So Seth, can an established and industrialized company salvage their culture and create a revolution that brings that rare form of connection that comes from significant work? And to that point, uh, you did mention Microsoft. Does it exemplify this? Yeah, I was about to, to rant about Microsoft. So thank you for teaming that up. <laughs> Uh, it's my job. <laughs> Steve Ballmer did everything he could to destroy that company. And uh, he single-handedly created an organization that missed five of the five most important revolutions in technology of the last 15 years. And he created a culture where the people who cared probably were thinking about leaving if they already didn't. And his successor, uh, Satya Nadella, showed up and said, we're famous. We're big, and the marketplace isn't going to wait for us anymore. Everyone's talking about other big tech companies, but not us anymore. What would happen if instead of measuring keystrokes, instead of challenging programmers to do one more line of code per day, we created the kind of place where people could do something that wasn't in the manual? And you don't have to like chat GPT. You don't have to like the new Bing. But you can look at what they did at a time when everyone said Google was insurmountable and how they did it. If you look at how Facebook has squandered tens of billions of dollars and has had to lay off an enormous number of people, they didn't even know what they did for a living because they were just shoveling coal into their machine. And you compare that to Microsoft's careful nurturing of a thing like LinkedIn, which most people don't even know they own. You know, there is a way for a giant corporation to do this, but it also works for small institutions, right? If you think about uh, the king of hospitality, Danny Meyer, and how Shake Shack showed up. And anytime a Shake Shack goes near a McDonald's, Shake Shack wins, hands down. If you think about what is it like for uh, a doctor who has an office with four people in it to go up against the Kaiser Permanente, how is it? that even though it's less convenient and possibly more expensive, you can't get in. Well, because sooner or later, humans, when given a choice, will make a choice. And what we really want is not to just feed the cycle of technology and profit, but maybe just do work we're proud of instead. I personally go out of my way to find all the little entrepreneurial businesses. Uh, I don't want to feed the machine either. Um, an aside question here, kind of a left field question and, and not where I was headed, but you did mention chat GPT and um, I know Elon Musk just, um, you know, put out there that he believes we should put like a halt on it because of um, everything that literally happened almost overnight once everybody got their hands on that technology, like the average person got their hands on the technology. But what do you feel about that? My general rule is always do the opposite of Elon Musk. Uh, <laughs> I didn't expect that answer. <laughs> you know, I think we should put a temporary hold on Twitter. I think we should put a temporary hold on full self-driving. And we should definitely put a temporary hold on flying to Mars because it's not going to save anybody's life and it's going to burn an enormous amount of fossil fuel. We need very thoughtful approaches to what GPT can do. It is a magic trick that is fooling us. Uh, I studied computer science as an undergrad. I took an advanced computer science seminar at a PhD level at Stanford a long, long, long time ago. And I did a project with Isaac Asimov. So I understand science fiction and AI more than the average person. And the way chat GPT works is one word at a time it figures out what to say, but it doesn't know anything. It's stupid, but we imagine that it is smart because that's how our brains work. And do I believe that as a group of humans who create culture, we have the obligation and the right to come up with guidelines to make sure that the cars are safe, medicines don't kill people and computers don't make things worse? Absolutely. But it is not clear to me that the skeptics of AI have done a good job of differentiating it from how in 2001 A Space Odyssey. It is entirely possible the world will end in our lifetime, 
I think it's unlikely to end because of an evil AI. I don't disagree. I but what I find really fascinating, um, you know, I've been on LinkedIn and Twitter, and there are AI. I, I don't even bots uh, the, masquerading as humans. Oh yeah, <laughs> on there. And here I am working tirelessly to put out quality content yeah. and thoughtful ideas and deep thinking and share beautiful and wonderful voices like yours on these platforms. And there's like this AI girl that looks like a Lara Croft that's got something like a million followers. I've like been on the app for like 12 years. I think I have five followers. Like I, why would people want to follow something that is non-existent and would feed their brains with the garbage that industrialization wants them to have? Like, why would they, why would they do that? Well, that's a brilliant point. And it's going to get 10,000 times worse. The spam, the scams, the disruptions, so much worse. We're going to look back at today as the good old days. Um, but it's not because of chat GPT. It's because people are gullible and stupid. And it's because that gullibility has been fueled by a lifetime of indoctrination. And when the industrialists figured out how to build factories, people are stunned when I tell them this. They were sure, like Andrew Carnegie and the rest of the big shots, that their biggest problem was going to be that people weren't going to buy enough stuff. That they looked at the mindset of the typical person who was not called a consumer back then. They were a person. And they said, how are we going to get these people to define their lives by what they buy and what crowd they're in? And it was a hundred year project that cost a trillion dollars and it worked. And so now you have very sensible people who are going into debt to get a handbag when they already have a handbag. Because that handbag is a symbol for them. So Lara Croft has a lot of followers because the people who are following her who have friends who are following her. And, you know, we're sort of hardwired for that. So we're going to have to build new systems really fast to be able to tell the difference between a friend who texts us and a computer who texts us, between someone who is honestly engaging with us and someone who wants us to uh, get something from some prince somewhere who left a lot of money in a briefcase. It's going to be really uh, weird for a long time. And that's why we have to figure out where are the humans in our life that we care about and not worry about reaching anybody but those people. I agree. I agree. Uh, you make a point in your book that scale is not the point. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is perfectly plotted right here. Um, you said WhatsApp had 19 employees when it was sold. When I read the story of Zappos, um, they had a culture that embraced the significance of the team and more importantly, the customer. And when they got bigger, they lost their culture. Mm -hmm. So if scale is not the point and can actually deconstruct the song of significance, how do we know when to stop? How does an organization know when more does not equal more. Okay, so to add to the indoctrination, we have the, the make-believe Nobel Prize economist, Milton Friedman, and the argument that the only purpose of a corporation is to maximize shareholder value. That's not written down anywhere before he went on about it, and it's not really true. CEOs think it's true because that's how they make more money. But in fact, that's not why you're here. And so when I think about my friend, Sean Eskenazi and his chocolate company, their motto is, it's not about the chocolate, it's about the chocolate. And what he means by that is, he visits every farmer who grows the beans. These are, this is the lowest paid profession on earth. Uh, we're talking about millions of people who make $3 a day. We're talking about millions of kids in child labor, uh, slavery situations who are harvesting the cacao that Nestle's and Hershey's is selling you. He visits every one of those farmers who supplies his beans every year. He pays them five times the market rate, five times. He sends their kids to private school. He has open book management. He only sells to uh, stores that sell directly to the customer. He doesn't deal with any wholesalers, which is why you can't find them at Whole Foods. Um, 
and he makes profit. But he doesn't make the most profit. He makes profit. And the race to be big and then sell, or the race to be big and then make an even bigger profit, isn't why the people who came to work for you work with you. It's not what, for example, coffee culture is about. Owning the most Starbucks isn't the answer. The answer is to say, there is a place where you can spend your time and your money. And in that window of time, your life will get better. And if we can make a living doing that, that's enough. Because the goal is not to sell more coffee. The goal is to make people better. I really love that. I, I wonder if um, if more businesses um, thought to be to build in public and to um, let everybody see what's happening, if transparency would keep it in check. I don't know. Well, these are great questions, Holly. Um, you know, transparency is a weird thing because if you get enough transparency, the photons overwhelm us and we stop paying attention to that too. So we've gone from one page of disclaimers when we get some drugs to 40 pages of disclaimers and we still don't know what the side effects are <laughs> yeah, right. because there's transparency, but they didn't say, and Seth, if you take this, you will get a headache that will last for four days because that's what I need to hear. But they don't have an obligation to talk directly to me. And when we think about companies that make things better when they get bigger, it sometimes happens, but it takes guts to be the CEO who says, now we're going to pause. And that happens sometimes. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens sometimes. If we look at uh, a musician or a director who has maintained a reputation for decades, it's because they didn't sell out and do the easy thing of making five sequels, right? Mm -hmm. And those people, if you talk to them when they're 80 years old, probably had a better life than the person who just kept churning out crap. I agree. So you stated, when we sing the song together, significance is a, is a choice. And you discussed a carpet business called Interface that led by example and created the best jobs that they ever had. Would you like to share that story? So I don't know about you, but I could never imagine working on the factory floor of a company that made carpet. It's dirty, it's hot, it's smelly, it's dangerous. You're taking petroleum from the ground, turning it into things like nylon, backing it with hot kind of rubber backing, churning it out by the millions. And that was the business that Ray Anderson built. And um, in the 70s, they did fine, they were growing. And then he read a book by Paul Hawken, Paul's first book about the climate. And he had an epiphany. And he called a meeting of his 12 most senior people. And he walked in and he said, look, we are destroying the only planet we have. Not just in general, but specifically us. That's what we do for a living. And he said, I want to build this company into the first fully sustainable, resilient floor covering company. I want this company to make things better than we found them. And he said, I don't know how to do it. And I'm not sure how long it will take. So here's a piece of paper. We will be sustainable by blank. And he said, you figure out how to get it done. You fill in the blank. And then he left the room. Mm -hmm. And his job was to create the conditions for these people to do this impossible thing. Now, it's interesting to note that along the way, they made more money, generated more shareholder value, and made a better product for more clients than they would have if they hadn't done. It's worth noting that at the beginning of the century, by the year 2000, they were well on their way to being climate neutral. And now they actually sequester and remove more carbon from the atmosphere than they create. But the punchline of the story is in the movie that I saw that had interviews with all these people 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later, even the ones who don't work there anymore say that was the best job I ever had. And they don't say that was the best job I ever had because they got paid a lot or because they didn't have to work very many hours. They say it because they got more done than they thought they could because they were treated with respect 
and they did something that mattered. And if you can do it at a carpet company and you can do it when you're a barista, not sure which job you can't do it in. That makes perfect sense, actually. Um, I'd like to bookend that question um, because you brought up um, carbon and emissions. So if cultivating significance breeds leaders that work together to create the very best work, can you share the story behind the design of the Carbon Almanac and how it taps into the song of increase? Um, and if you also want to share what that project was about, I would love for that because I know on your podcast, Akimbo, that I consume all the time. Um, it is your baby. So I, I want to give it pride of place here. Well, thank you. Um, it changed my life and I can talk about it quite a bit. Um, about two years ago, I realized that I wasn't talking about climate change on my blog that much. I wrote my first post about it 18 years ago. And the reason I wasn't talking about it that much is because I felt stupid. I felt underinformed. I felt manipulated. And I thought, well, if I feel that way, I bet other people do too. So I organized, I did not write, but I organized a project with 300 people in 40 countries, we've since grown to 1,900 people in 90 countries, that all volunteers, including me, came together and built a 97,000 word, 300 page, footnoted, fact checked, illustrated, uh, copy edited almanac of what's going on in the climate. And I learned so much from this project and met some really extraordinary people online. But one of the things that I learned is that extraordinary work is possible if the right people choose to do it with each other, if there's enrollment in the journey. And the second thing which we talk about, which I talk about in the Song of Significance, is page 19 thinking. And page 19 thinking is a concept that we came up with, me and three or four other people inside uh, the group. And we said, look, the Almanac's going to have page 19. We know that. There's an 18, there's a 20, there's going to be a 19. We also know that there's not one person in this room who has ever written that page before, nor is there anybody here who knows how to do the typesetting and writing and copy editing and all the other tasks needed to get page 19 done. And yet there's going to be a page 19. So how are we going to get that done? And the answer is page 19 thinking, which is you don't have to finish the page, but you do have to start it. You do have to make it a little bit better. You have to be able to say to the group, I made this. And there's a difference between criticizing the work and criticizing the worker. We had enormously high standards. That's why there are no significant errors in the book. We criticized the work all the time, but we weren't criticizing the person who made the work. And this feeling that human beings get, the liminal space from here to there, to be on this journey of creation, that's what Jacqueline Freeman calls the song of significant, uh, song of increase. The song of increase is that leap, that feeling that we're headed into the void. And she got it from the bees she works with as a beekeeper. Um, but we're not bees, we're humans. And so I took that original concept of the song of increase and expanded it into what I want to talk about when we think about work, which is we need to make a living, but we also need to make a life. So I love the page 19 theory. And what I find very interesting is that um, you is bringing clarity between the criticizing of the person or the content. And I think um, people are take things personally and are on the defense because it's been drilled into us mm -hmm. uh, through industrialization, uh, through school and so forth. But like you were saying, like you knew nothing about what you were building. And let's face it, somebody could build page 20 and all of the content in there is perfection and there's nothing to change. But, you know, a year later, it might not be relevant and has to be changed again. But if you if you build a team that understands that what they did in that moment was great work, 
then they're not going to take it personally that now it has to be completely redone. But, but we don't do that. Like we don't do that in school. We don't even do that with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we adopt that song of increase? <laughs> how do we do that? Lots of people want to run the marathon. And if you hire a coach and say, please train me to run the marathon without getting tired, they will not be able to help you. You can learn to run the marathon, but you also have to understand that the people who finish the marathon are the ones who figure out where to put the tired. So when we are looking at this opportunity in front of us, I can't help you get there without it feeling odd, without it feeling like you're on the spot, without it feeling like it might not work. Yeah, that's part of it. And that is what we got trained to be worried about. That you know, Instagram pushes teenage girls to become very unhappy by elevating surface uh, optics over everything else. And when someone doesn't, quote, like you, you feel like they don't like you. When in fact, they don't know you. They just didn't press some button somewhere to make money for Mark Zuckerberg. And we just keep reminding people from you know, elementary school on that you're being judged all the time. And what I'm trying to help people understand is that their work is being judged all the time. And you can change your work without not liking yourself. That's like perfection. I have a question about mission statements. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm glad that I made you laugh before you asked it. Um, they're, they're usually a joke, right? Yep. Uh, you know, mission statement, we are for people, planet, and whatever. You know, it's 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 always a joke, right? Um, a bunch of people, talking heads, sitting in a conference room, and they come up with the same jargon that everybody else does. Should businesses throw away mission statements that they don't live up to, um, embrace the song of significance, and proudly put it into practice and applaud the song of increase and change? Oh, well, that's not the question I thought you were going to ask. You know, as someone who <laughs> devoted so much of their life to writing this book, I think everyone could probably have a useful conversation talking about it. I don't think everyone will or should agree with me, but I think we should have the conversation. But the mission statement thing has fascinated me for a long time because we need to, before we do anything at work, figure out what it's for, right? And mostly what a mission statement is for is to make the people on the committee feel glad that they were on the committee and to deflect certain kinds of criticism from the institution. Carnegie Hall's mission statement is written in 5,000 point type on the outside of their building in New York City and it's meaningless. What makes a, a mission statement meaningful is does it help everyone in the institution make a decision? If it is not going to help you make a decision, it has no purpose. But if you make a decision based on the mission statement, right? The postal service through hail and snow and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, that means if you're a mail person, you've got to deliver the mail, even if it's raining out. Mm -hmm. You don't get to stay home. That's the mission statement. So at the beginning... Federal Express had two elements to their mission statement. One, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. And as a result, for example, a driver, a driver at Federal Express used their credit card to charter a helicopter to get over a snowed out mountain pass to deliver one package because that's what they're supposed to do. They don't do that anymore. And the second thing that FedEx used to do is answer the phone on the first ring. And they made it very clear that they weren't the post office. And if you're somebody who's paying 20 bucks for a package instead of 14 cents to mail something, we're going to answer the phone on the first ring. They don't do that anymore either. Nobody because does. Now they're, <laughs> well, that's actually not true. There are plenty of institutions that still do because they have decided that that is a cheap way to stand for something. And so what we need to do if we want people to be significant is give them the chance to make a decision. Because if you're not making a decision at work, then you're just a cog on the assembly line. 
And we've got to figure out which decisions can we give other people the privilege to make and still live with whatever they choose in that moment. We can always decide tomorrow that we have to do something different based on that. But we've tended to reserve decisions to just a few people. And every chance companies get to have frontline workers not make a decision, for example, at McDonald's, they don't get to decide how long to cook the French fries, press the red button, it starts cooking. And when it's done, it comes out. They took that decision away, which probably leads to more reliable French fries, but also makes your job less important because now they're going to find a, a robot to press the red button and we don't need you anymore at all. And so I guess what I'm getting at in my book is what we actually make for a living is decisions. And if you're going to run any sort of institution, you better get comfortable with that. I'm, I'm wondering because I see this on LinkedIn. Um, now you're saying with McDonald's, you press the red button, the fries start, and then it, it goes off. But in an effort to um, have the workforce specialize you know where I'm kind of going with this, don't you? Uh, to specialize, like to to literally give somebody the narrowest channel possible to do their job. What I see on LinkedIn all day long is the person that announces, I got a new job and I'm so excited to work at this forward thinking company with these great humans doing this wonderful job. And, you know, they, they use all of the catchphrases and acronyms and whatever else. And it's their, you know, entrance speech, you know, so excited. And literally three months later, the same identical post is up saying, um, with regret, I'm leaving mm -hmm. this job. Um, great things on the horizon, you know, stay, stay with me. It's been such a pleasure to work with these amazing humans for this great company, blah, 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 blah. The entrance and exit speech are identical. <laughs> <laughs> what is your take on that? <laughs> Well, controversially in the book, I say that turnover is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Not the turnover of the brutality of Amazon or Twitter, where you're racing as fast as you can to be a cog in a machine. But the, the turnover of, I want to go this way, and they want to go over there. Because the industrial mindset is, doesn't matter. If you want to eat, come with us. That's the only option you have. But if you want people to be engaged in where you're going, they need to be enrolled in the journey. And one of the challenges I think you're talking about is at many institutions, the people who are doing the hiring and the people who are doing the working are different. And so if a good hiring professional seduces you to enroll in one thing and you get to work and it's a different thing, well, then I think everyone owes it to everyone else to just move on. But being really clear, about what things are like around here is the key. So at the beginning of the Almanac, again, it was all volunteer, easy in, easy out. I worked full time. A lot of people, most people didn't. The first month, a whole bunch of people came and went. Dozens and dozens and dozens of people. I was thrilled because it meant we stood for something, that we weren't willing to average it out to make everybody happy. We knew exactly what we were trying to do. And four people from a really well-known company came sort of on a quasi-volunteer assignment from their boss to, to help us. And five days later, they were all gone hmm. because they wanted it to be way more corporate. They wanted way more reporting. They wanted way more hierarchy. Who's in charge of who? Who tells who what to do? And I was like, good luck to you, but that's not what we are. That's not where we're going. So thank you for speaking up. I'm glad that this isn't going to get in the way of you feeding your family, but this isn't a good fit. So that kind of speaks to your line in the book that management is the race to the bottom, but developing leaders lets us climb to the top together right. in, in the song of significance. Right. And, you know, so as we wrap this up, some people are hearing this and saying, wow, I wish my company would do that for me. Or they're saying, well, I've been doing that all along, but no one will come with me. And what I'm arguing and the reason it's a book and not some piece of digital stuff is 
books are a really good thing to use to have a conversation. Let's talk about this. As Manad Kostler says, let's get real or let's not play. If you're not serious about these sorts of things, about diversity, about uh, overcoming caste systems and false proxies, then I don't want to work with you. I have enough talent to go somewhere else. Because if the people with the choice start going somewhere else, the system's going to change. I suspect that the Song of Significance is going to start a lot of revolutions. I hope it does, because I've I've been studying uh, culture for a while now and and started in the middle of the pandemic or when the pandemic just started. And the the degradation of the human experience is is been sad to watch. Um, and we need work life balance. I think the Song of Significance is the answer to that. I really do. I hope so. I'm doing my best, but people like you are making a very big difference. Thank so you. I appreciate your focus and your care and your time. And, you know, we only get tomorrow one time. Let's do it better than we are expecting. Thank you, Seth Godin, for all these mic drops. This is so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, obviously all the links are going to be in the show notes. Uh, my last question for you is about a tour. Are you doing one? Well, here I am. And here you are. Um, you know, the, the idea of a book tour has transformed over the years. My first book came out in 1986. I wrote it with Chip Conley and I did a book signing at a Barnes and Noble. And the day before I did it, serious sprain of my ankle playing ultimate Frisbee. But a deal's a deal. And I showed up on crutches and I'm sitting there behind the table and there's like, you know, 40 copies of the book. And someone walks up to the table, picks it up, looks at the front cover, looks at the back cover, puts it down and walks away. Like that's heartbreaking. That Godin's is heartbreaking. Godin's rule is if the author is anywhere nearby, if you get within 10 feet, you got to buy a copy of the book. Absolutely. Or at least hide it somewhere in the store. But do not put it back on the table. No, that's that's horrible. So ever since then, uh, <laughs> I've, I've been hesitant to show up in bookstores. I don't fly anymore, so there isn't going to be a lot of me dancing around the planet. Um, but I will tell you one uh, conversation I had with uh, my former publisher. Uh, I used to give a lot of speeches around the world. And one particular week when a book was coming out was very busy, and I was in six airports in four days. And I sent them a note. I say... I was in six airports in four days and I'm here to tell you that not one bookstore in one airport had my book. And he wrote back and he said, don't worry if you tell us which bookstores you'll be passing as you race through the airport, we'll make sure that there's a book there for you to notice. I was like, you don't understand. <laughs> the point is the point. to try to trick the author into thinking the book is everywhere. I was just giving you a data point. So all a long way of saying, in the digital world, things are different. One of the things we're doing is if people buy five copies of the book, we're, I'm giving them 25 copies of the pamphlet so you can just hand them out like candy. Because the theory is you don't write a book to sell books. You don't write a book to cut down trees. You write a book to make a difference. And if I can use this moment in time to talk to people like you and elevate the conversation, it, the whole thing is worth it. Well, thank you. That's a huge compliment. I thank you so, so much. And um, I'm sorry I won't be able to meet you in person to have you sign the book, but um, I do get it. It, it. And But I, I might want to point out that after, you know, 21 bestsellers, I have a feeling that people will show up. It's a little bit different <laughs> story now, Seth. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, thank you. Thank Holly. you. Keep making a ruckus. It matters. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. We did it. It's a wrap. <laughs> you did it. You're so you. thoughtful. You went in all the right places. This was a true pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank so you. I appreciate it. I, I really do. Send me the link when you're live at the end of May. I'll put it on my podcast page. <gasps> you're awesome. Thank you. I will. See you. Bye. Bye, Bye. So I just finished this interview with Seth Godin uh, with the Song of Significance. And to quote Seth, value can only come from change, from hum humanity, and that rare form of connection that comes from significance. 
It's the emotional labor of showing up because we care. Connection is what we all seek. In the Song of Significance, Seth Godin shares how companies can create the best job you ever had, and the key is through leadership. Seth shares that a team will rally around a project or a company if they know and feel they are connected to and part of the song. The race to the bottom is by managing people, ensuring that they stand on the red dot. It's industrialism, and it survives because you only sing their song. I'm Holly Shannon, and you've been with me through five seasons as we have traversed all things culture. Are you ready to start a revolution? Are you poised to be a leader and to take this blueprint to capitalize on connection instead of human capital? Thank you. That's a wrap on season five, Coffee Culture. Thanks for being part of it. Share your thoughts and ideas on coffee culture. You could put them in the reviews on Apple Podcasts or DM me on Instagram. And if you'd like to support an indie podcaster, there is a link in the show notes for buying me a coffee. Please subscribe and share a cup of coffee culture with your friends. This season is produced by Pale Blue Studios.